and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Hello, welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. Michael Loke will be joining us in a moment for the news. Today's podcast is number 65, and it's with Travis Walton. I was around Travis all last weekend, and we had some great conversations, which uh, brought me to think about something that no one had ever interviewed him about other topics other than the famous fire in the sky abduction back in November of 1975. So we have a great interview coming up only 15 minutes long or so. It's a short one, but it's fascinating, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Following the news, but before Travis Walton, we have a new China correspondent that will be checking in with us, oh, maybe about once a month, and he'll talk to us about what's going on there. I'll talk a little bit more about that and introduce him later on. I will be attending the first New England UFO conference that will take place on Saturday, October 26th. That's in Lemister, Massachusetts. If you can make it there, I'd love to hang out with you. Stanton Friedman, Peter Robbins, and a number of other great speakers are going to be there, including Robert Schroeder, the scientist who we had on here perhaps a month or so ago. So, Michael, how are you doing? Good. How are you this week? Great. What is going on? Well, uh... First off, the Vancouver minor league baseball game sighting was a hoax. The recent video shot of a strange object buzzing a Vancouver minor league baseball game has been revealed to be a promotional stunt. The nearby H.R. McMillan Space Center perpetrated the hoax to promote upgrades to their planetarium. The object seen and photographed by not only baseball fans but also others in the surrounding area was actually a one-meter-wide drone launched by the Space Center meant to attract attention. Uh, You can read more about it in uh, the link in our show notes, as with all our stories. Yeah, Michael, I have an issue with this. Uh, I'm a little upset about it. Well, first of all, I want to say I was on a radio show last night, and the person talking to me was talking all about this sighting, and had I known about it, no, I had not. And uh, sure enough, I opened the news you wrote this morning and read that it was a hoax. And why would a planetarium hoax something like that? Uh, I, it's upsetting to me. How do you feel I, about that? I, you know, I posted on our forums uh, a couple months ago promotions done with drones to make the Star Trek insignia appear over London. Oh, I yeah. thought mm-hmm. I thought that was brilliant. I th- I thought that was that was great. This. Um, was really the worst kind of advertising. I mean, they were trying to make people think something was in the the sky that wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, UFO aside, I mean, this is kind of the the problem with drones is that, you know, what if if people are calling that in, which maybe some did, to say that there's something in in the sky lanes over Vancouver? Um, It's a real problem. It shows... Uh, the many problems that are going to occur when drones are available to a wide variety of, of people and businesses, uh, which is scheduled to happen, I believe, next year in America. And um, it just for, for this to be a, a, you know, a space center, a supposed institute of science to to do something like this, it just seems really intellectually dishonest on top of everything else. I do, too. And you read the comments under it. And they, there are people out there that saying, you know, scientists don't believe. Why would you even do this? And, you know, there's quite a few comments to read under that if someone follows the link to that article. Anyway, it pisses me off. So what else is going on? <laughs> a new poll claims 48 percent of Americans believe UFOs may be aliens. A recent online poll conducted by the Huffington Post and YouGov found that 48% of Americans believe that people may have actually seen UFOs under alien control. The same poll found that 61% of people had thought they'd actually seen ghosts or knew someone who had. Um, The poll was conducted using an opt-in online format. Uh, And that's just important because it might not be quite as representative as 
they would like you to believe. And in contrast, the famous 1997 CNN Time poll found that 64% of Americans thought aliens had actually contacted the Earth, uh, and that was almost 20 years ago. It, it, I find it very hard to believe we're going backwards. What do you think about that? Yeah, I really don't either. With, For one thing, with all the science that's come forward on all the you know possibilities of extraterrestrial life existing— and I'm wondering why the heck they threw ghosts in the mix. You know, that's just that. I don't know. That I have issues with a lot of things today. I guess that bothers <laughs> me too. Uh, I I just like to mention in in our links to the show notes. Not only is there a link to the story, but there's actually a link to the raw poll data as well, so people can see the demographic breakdowns of that if they're interested. So I don't really think that there's less people believing that we have been visited. Than before, what do you think about that? Uh, I I just I, I was shocked by that. I I didn't I didn't think it was. Uh, I I was very surprised by. It. Let's just put it that way. That's why I went and and dug back and found the the ninety seven CNN time poll that was big news at the time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that I place a little bit more faith in for just just because it's not an, an internet opt-in poll, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which which just does limit your sampling. It always does. Exactly. Astrobiology Magazine examines the Drake Equation. NASA's online Astrobiology Magazine recently examined the famous Drake Equation, interviewing MIT exoplanet expert Sarah Seeger. Their feature not only explains the equation, But Seeger also explains the numbers that she uses personally to fill in the variables. Visit the link in the show notes to read the article and view the connected video. Yeah, it's most likely that, you know, Drake was off just a little bit on that one. And I didn't get a chance, I'm sorry, I was a little busy, to read over things today. What is her equations that she plunked in there? Well, it's it's not. I mean, it's still the Drake equation. Uh, she just goes through her thought process for the for the myriad of variables involved. She's a little bit conservative, but it still gives us a, a real good chance to to uh, have neighbors out there. So it's the Drake Seeger equation, I guess. Well, no, it's still the Drake equation because the Drake equation is entirely made up of variables. Ah, okay. you you. That's part of the pro. That's why some people can quote the Drake equation, and it's you know just proof that it's unlikely there's another civilization. While others can quote the Drake civilization, and it, you know it's proof that that uh, there's a intergalactic parking lot behind the moon that we're not aware of. Um, it's it's all in the variables you put in because she is an exoplanet expert who has been studying. Uh, the planets is, that we discover outside of our solar system, she has a you know probably a little bit more valid viewpoint on at least some of the variables, like how many would be in the Goldilocks zone, et cetera. I see. X Files at twenty. This week marked the twentieth anniversary of Fox's The X Files, which premiered on September 10, nineteen ninety three. Although the show is fictional, it helped to create a surge of interest in the paranormal and UFOs. It also popularized the famous I Want to Believe poster and the Truth is Out There slogan. With an anniversary and a recent order for a pilot by Amazon.com from the original X-Files creator Chris Carter, there is renewed talk of a possible third X-Files feature film or even possibly a reboot. Were you a fan back in the day? I did watch, you know, I wasn't glued to the show, but I'd watch shows here and there. And I watched the movie. I can't remember which movie it was. Uh, Perhaps the last one. It wasn't that good. It was okay. Then Um, it was probably the second one. (laughs) Yeah, I guess it was the second one. That's right. And I just started rewatching on Netflix. And, you know, I never realized now that I've been really involved in this, how many parallels there are to things that actually have been witnessed that they actually throw in there in the shows. It's pretty interesting to see that. It it really was a good show. Um, I tried to watch it again a few years ago, though, and I have to admit, I, I just, as much as I loved it 20 years ago, f- three or four years ago, it just bored me to no description. I, I think I made it through half the first season and, and gave up. You know, I think it has to do with uh, we almost have so much thrown at us that we become uh, numb to uh, sensationalism unless it's uh, even more and more 
out there or something. I, I know what you're talking about. Um, maybe I, I just think it was something about the style of the show. I, I don't think it was it, it, it really is the subject or thing. I just think when I go back and watch it, it's 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 so dark, it's so gray, it's so it, it's I actually find the show itself kind of hard to watch because okay. I'm picky like that, you know. All right, du- duly noted. No, I'm not going to go there again. Okay. And finally, putting you on the hot seat, Experiencers Speak Conference. The Main Sun Journal covered the recent Experiencers Speak event, highlighting the experiences of Travis Walton and the men involved in the Allagash incident. The paper also spoke with Stanton Friedman. Most important of all, though, was a brief conversation with our own Martin Willis. So, Martin, what can you tell us about the conference, and uh, why is it that I had to find this article myself during the weekly news search? Well, you know, you've, I hadn't even found it. So, you know, the, the woman that interviewed me said she was from up in Maine about another 100 miles, so I figured it wouldn't even be out there. I didn't even think it would be on the Internet. So, anyway, yeah, it was a great you, weekend. Rest assured, you are not the first person who has said, I didn't think it would find its way to the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, it was a a wonderful weekend. Uh, Audrey Hewins put that on, and she did a, a fantastic job. There was not a single glitch in the whole thing. One of my favorite parts was the Q&A panel um, on Saturday night. Every speaker was up there, and we threw questions at them, and uh, that was that was really exciting. But just to sit and talk with all these great people, Stan Friedman, and uh, again, uh, I spoke with Travis Walton, off the record, and there was a lot of really good conversation with all these iconic people there. Um, just other people you connect with at these symposiums. I highly recommend them if you can get to one. It was just real enjoyable to be around people with the same interests, and also some people that I know from my occupation and longtime friends uh, came up to listen to Travis, and it was just a blast sitting there uh, listening to them, and they were real excited to meet him, you know, had their picture taken and all that. It was a great weekend overall. Really enjoyed it. Good. Good. That's good to hear. I mean, I, I, I think we should uh, encourage all our listeners to get out and support these kind of events if they can. Yes. And, you know, at one time it said in that newspaper article that there was 80 people. Well, that may have been when she was there, but there were some times when that place was just absolutely packed with people. And it's going to go on again next year. And it was great for me because it's only six miles away, 5.8 miles away from my door. So that was really nice. So we can all stay with you next year. Yeah, yeah sure. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now thanks for the news, but hold on for a minute because uh, we have been wanting to add an international point of view about this topic. And indeed, if UFOs are regularly seen all the way around the other side of the world, it tends to show that it's a worldwide phenomenon, don't you think? So Mark... Sima joins us all the way from Beijing. Welcome, Mark. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me. So, Mark, what's going on in China? Well, we we have all UFO phenomena as well. So, in um, in the Middle Kingdom, uh, through the ages, there are records of uh, UFO sightings. And uh, in recent years, as you have noted in, in the in the podcast, they and I know that Michael is very much fond of everything um, related to to China. Uh, they there has been some some quite um, uh, impressive sightings, and I've been here. Um, this is my second time in the last five years, but I've been here for um, for two consecutive years now in, in uh, teaching in Beijing, and. I think that if I have to pick one um, main uh, event uh, that is recurring uh, over the last um, couple of years, uh, three years, are uh, sightings above international airports, Chinese international airports. And, you know, you have a lot of cities in China. You have um, 90 cities over 1 million people, and that that means a lot of airports. And those... um, uh, Events are significant enough for the for the traffic to be to be stopped. So the the air traffic uh, is diverted. The airport is closed down, is shut down for for a period of time. It's very disruptive, and a lot of people see those um, those lights, those objects, and uh, take picture of them, put them on on social media. Um, it's printed in, in in the press. It's shown on TV, and and it makes uh, it makes the run. So we have a 
um, I think, a very impressive uh, recurring UFO phenomena happening near airports all over all over China and, and uh, from um, uh, quite way back. But let's say from 2010, we have a very uh, important event above Hangzhou Airport, and Hangzhou is well known to foreigners because a lot of people go there for for, for tourism. It's one of the cute cities, um, coastal cities. A romantic city in in China, and um, well, the the airport got uh, shut down there. But it has been reported in uh, a number of times in 2011, 2012 as well, uh, above cities um, in Inner Mongolia, as far as uh, Chengdu in Shanxi, that the heartland of the country. So um, a number of airports have been affected by by those um, those large UFOs. Actually, aren't there only three international airports in China? Aren't all the other airports uh, only for internal use? I th- I thought only Beijing and Shanghai had international airports, and that's part of why uh, maybe these don't stories don't get all the coverage worldwide that because they don't affect international mm-hmm. flights. Well, actually, uh, Hangzhou is an international airport, and Chengdu is an international airport, and. Uh, Xiamen is an international airport. You have more, but they are not as international as the, the Guangzhou, which is in the south, in, uh, and uh, Shanghai and, and Beijing towards the north, because the other airport, although they're international, they, they only carry, you know, they go to the, um, you know, across Russia, or they go to Thailand, or they go to Taiwan, or they go to, you, you see what I mean? They're not fully full-blown international, but they are called international. They, they go beyond China. Oh, okay. But, but one of the things I've heard about these sightings is if they were causing the closure of airports, why aren't they affecting air flights? So, so these are still airports that even, even though they might be closing down, they're not, they, they wouldn't necessarily be affecting the continental flights, the, the uh, continental, the airline, not, not a, you know, the, the Delta flights, the kind of big international carriers. Is, is that? I see, I see what you mean. I think maybe the, the short answer for that, and this needs to be, to be checked more, but I think it's because uh, they were closed down um, for short time, maybe sometime less than an hour. So it, during that hour, the, the uh, plane would be diverted. But if you are, you know, if it's a plane coming from the States, it has time to, to prepare. So maybe when those events happened, uh, there were no international, you know, uh, uh, planes scheduled to land just at that moment. The vast majority of, of traffic still is uh, Chinese uh, domestic flights. Whatever they land in uh, domestic or international airports, the, the vast majority are the, the flight, the, the many, many, many flights between cities. So uh, maybe if you, if you fly from Paris and you have 11 hours flight, it takes time to, to reach to, to Beijing. And if the air, airport is, is um, disturbed for one hour, well, maybe you have time to... Um, to solve the problem before the, f- the flight is is ready to land. True enough. Yeah, it's it's True. 15 from Chicago to Shanghai. So so yeah, and and that's something we should probably um, reinforce to the listeners because I think a lot of them really won't think of this, but but China, mainland China, is a little bit larger than the continental 48 states of the United States. So if our American listeners just think of all of the flights that go just inside the United States, you have a similar amount of air traffic in China. Sure, because you have so many, so you know, so many cities uh, above one million, and all those cities have an airport. So you have ninety cities ab- above one million people, and you have many who are uh, ten million and more, and then you have the the mega cities that are twenty five, thirty five million people, like Chongqing. So, yeah, a lot of airports, a lot of traffic, and it, it's starting to be a real problem between the, the it's, they're competing for space with the military, um, with the Air Force and the Chinese Air Force and the, the civilian um, traffic. Now, I've heard that China takes these things really serious and they even have scientists that are on some type of board. Do you know anything about that? 
Well, we, we never know those things directly because um, they're not shy about keeping uh, many things secret. Uh, mm -hmm. But what we, what we know is that they um, uh, review the cases and they're interested by it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, they seems they ask a lot of questions to the, the Chinese UFO enthusiasts, you know, those people who are leading those um, uh, UFO organizations in China. And they have those... Um, a casual conversation between a high-ranking officer in the Air Force, for example, and those, uh, the, those leaders of those uh, UFO organizations. The, it, it seems they're really genuinely trying to figure out what they are, and they, and, and, uh, they are quite mesmerized. I don't think they have... Uh, the, the impression it gives that they don't know what it is, and they, there's never the indication they think it is a spy plane or it is a, a, you know, an unknown weapon or a misfired rocket. Uh, they they don't try to to hide the fact that uh, uh, they don't know. So you you have the um, observatories that release some statements. So at the level of observatories, so, so you have a big observa uh, space observatory around uh, uh, Beijing uh, in the province of Hebei, which is all around Beijing, and they and they do release statements. Uh, saying that um, they've looked into it and they could not explain the, the, the phenomenon. I think that's, um, that's pretty, that, that's good enough. I do too. Now, we have recently seen some reports from the Indian military along the Sino-Indian border uh, about strange lights that they are concerned uh, would be some kind of Chinese aircraft or Chinese drones that they do not believe are actually... Uh, any kind of uh, conventional aircraft. Have you heard anything about that in China? Is that getting any attention there? Well, what we, what you have in the Chinese press are basically the Indian report uh, uh, printed, translated in Chinese and printed um, in the official press here. So uh, they comment on those reports and uh, what what have on on the matter of drones and and special vehicles they, the 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 storyline we have here is that uh, the, both sides would like to fly drones over each other and they they refrain from doing so it's a very sensitive um, area in the himalaya between the two countries uh, it was very very tense uh, only a few months ago uh, when there were even talk of um, you know a clash and the Prime Minister of China had to go to New Delhi to, to smooth things on, 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 the border, on the, of the question of the border area. So it's, it's not um, a joking matter, it's a very serious matter. The, the, uh, those two armies were facing off in, in the mountain of Himalaya. So if it was a drone, I think the Indians would have had the proof, because it's, it's not anybody sitting there, it's, it's, the, it's the military with all their gear. and. Uh, no one has been able to to prove that they were vehicles, they were they were man-made. So there are lights in the sky, and there's been a confusion about could there be some bright stars that uh, soldiers um, uh, confuse with um, uh, with UFOs. And it seems that maybe it happened for it. it you can explain that for some uh, accounts, but not all of them. So it, uh, the, I think the, the story, the, the mystery remains, really. If, if the Indians could, could have blamed the Chinese for flying unlawful um, vehicles above, above the border, I think they would have done it. I, you know, this is a terrible story, uh, not terrible in a serious way. But uh, we were following for a while the, the gentleman who claimed to have an alien in his freezer— <laughs> <laughs> that that he accidentally electrocuted while trying to kill rabbits with by hooking a car battery to a piece of fence, who apparently got arrested uh, for claiming on uh, the Chinese social media that that he had an alien in his freezer. Did did you see any of that at all in China? Yes, sure. It was it was widely reported here, and people laugh about it. And basically, it was someone who was um, who was probably very lonely and wanted um, the world attention, and he, he certainly did it. And I think it's in the city of, of Xiamen, a coastal city facing uh, Taiwan. It was a hoax. Everybody said it was a hoax. So, so nobody actually believed it then. No, no, and I, I don't think the perpetrator believed what he was saying either. So it, it was. Um, it was a hoax. Now, 
to hoax and to put a story on the internet is a, a, is a criminal offense in China, and uh, the regulation has changed even re uh, more recently. So it's something which is uh, very much discouraged because it can land you in jail. So that, that maybe will clean up the, the field, actually. <laughs> For some reason, that kind of appeals to me that uh, that it's a criminal charge for a hoax. Can you imagine how many things would be wiped off of YouTube if that was so? The planetarium would be in jail. Yeah, right I now. say the planetarium would be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. do, do you know what happened to him? The last report we saw was that he was arrested and we never heard about it again. I, I, I don't know if he was kept or if he was let go. I, I, we don't know. We don't know, but uh, he's been ridiculed and nobody cares, basically. <laughs> what, what I think is a more, more interesting story is, uh, the, is the old story of Mr. Mang in 1994, who, uh, Mr. Mang Zhao who uh, claimed in June 94 to have been abducted while he was hiking in uh, Heilongjiang province in northeast of China. And... Uh, he says that he has met um, aliens. Uh, they were they were very tall, more than nine feet tall, and uh, they had him copulate on board spacecraft. They showed him Jupiter, and it was taken quite seriously at the time uh, because the, for example, the University of uh, Honan made a thorough study um, of his case, and they interviewed him and they brought him there. And they concluded, they had a, an official conclusion that probably his initial story was true. And then the, everything that he said afterward, the recurring story of his abduction, were probably untrue. Uh, so, but they, still you have a Chinese university or a department within, within Chinese university that seems to, to say that, um, yes, Mr. Meng seems to indeed have been abducted at least one time. Wow, that's really interesting. Thank you so much, Mark. We really appreciate your report, and we'll be checking back with you. Thanks for joining us this week. It was great to talk with you. Can you hear the thunder? Can you yes, hear the yes, thunder? I, yeah. I heard it earlier. Next coming up is a tune by Carrie Lloyd Whitehouse, followed by the interview I had with Travis Walton over the weekend. I'm with Travis Walton, and uh, thanks for joining me, Travis. Good to be here. We had uh, a lot of interesting conversations, I thought, over this weekend. And I decided that I wanted to talk to you about everything except your incident that you had. Uh, is that going to be a relief in a way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought you had some really good insights. You had talked, you thought there were two different types of abductions. One, like the one that happened to you, and then other types can you go into that a little? Well, you know, there might be multiple phenomena going on uh, here because it does seem that there might be more than two types. You know, just to, the whole uh, character and um, the, the, the various traits that, that each of these types have in common, they seem to, to go where these various characteristics are grouped together, but they seem to be distinct from each other. There was some discussion last night about uh, 
negative versus positive, you know, mm -hmm. how, how the negative ones have all these certain things in common and then, and then the positive ones have certain things in common and it's not like an overlap or a blend at all. And that's um, kind of interesting. I would say after listening to you a bunch of times that, again, we don't want to focus on your situation, but that was more of a positive um, in a way because you were possibly healed yeah, it's it it has been a, a gradual dawning realization with me that uh, I'm finally realizing that it, it, that the my perception of it as being so negative was really uh, not really warranted by the facts of the situation and more by the the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, that thing you were zapped with may not have been intentional it's a possibility yeah because of yeah the energy. not, not a, a beam that was fired at all just some sort of a, a, a discharge a side effect of uh, the propulsion system yeah and you and i talked a little bit about space travel and can you you kind of go into your your side your your thought about that because uh, you know the number one thing uh, we always hear or i don't want to say the number one thing but we hear it a lot is that they shouldn't be able to get here. It's too far. Well, yeah, that's the number one thing that the uh, uh, scientists uh, are always coming up with. And uh, they're always trying to place uh, 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 the limitations on these uh, advanced civilizations, uh, the uh, limitations that we find ourselves in, <laughs> and mm -hmm. based on, the, on, again, the limitations of our uh, state of knowledge. You know, 100 years ago, we didn't have airplanes. We barely even had radio. And uh, in a mere 100 years, we've come this far. And uh, these uh, civilizations could be hundreds of thousands or millions of years uh, farther ahead of us than, than that. So you, can, you just cannot put limitations on what they're capable of based on our understanding. Yeah. It's, it's absurd, and it's a kind of an orthodoxy that just doesn't seem to go away with some scientists. Um, you know, you can point to uh, scientists from 100 years ago or 200 years ago making uh, stark pronouncements about, you know, man could never travel faster than 60 miles an hour, or man will never yeah. uh, fly anything heavier than aircraft, or man will never go to the moon. And these kinds of things were said by, you know, uh, prominent scientists uh, with all the authority of, of uh, the state of knowledge of the day. And I, you also said to me, basically, science and scientists, uh, they have to be open-minded that they're going to be proven wrong. Right. Over and, and over. you know, it's it's not scientific. It's uh, it's unscientific to ever have an orthodoxy. Science does not in uh, true science does not engage in orthodoxies. And when you do, that's when you're uh, putting on the blinders. That's ignorance, not science. Right, right. Now, a lot of times, you know, I I, I listen to you. I've listened to Kathleen Martin about you know uh, Betty and Barney Hill. Uh, last night I talked to the uh, to Jim uh, Weiner and uh, Chuck Fultz about the Allagas situation. To me, these are all very credible situations. Now, you also hear a lot of accounts that sound really far out. And are you able to be open-minded that they're possible? Or I mean, I got to tell you, when I listen to a lot of them, I cringe. You know? Yeah, yeah. Some of the th accounts I hear do make me cringe, and it's been that way from the beginning. Uh, yeah. But you know, uh, I've steadfastly resisted the temptation to uh, pass judgment on these cases. Um, but when I say, uh, you know, people are um, people have an either-or attitude. E something is either true, and I believe it, and if I don't believe it, then it's not then it's not true. But that's not the way the world really is. You know, if a man is found not guilty, that doesn't mean he's innocent. He's just not guilty. Hmm. If something, if I say this is something that I don't believe, that doesn't mean that it's untrue. It just means I don't put it in the category of true. Anything that's unproven, you know, that's the, the mistake that the skeptics make. Hmm. They categorize everything that is not yet proven as disproven. And that's, right. that's, again, an ignorant attitude. Uh, it's, it's the other end of the spectrum. 
the, the skeptic's making the same mistake that the gullible person makes. The gullible person right. says, if you can't prove this isn't true, that means it is true. And that's not true either. Yeah. Well, as one of the listeners to the show often says, it's pseudo-skepticism. It's not real skepticism. Yeah, and, you know, we could uh, split hairs about words. I think, uh, you know, the, the, way are there, the way they're using the word skepticism, it's, it's a derogatory term, and they wear it like a, a proud banner. And, That's right, yeah. And the all they're doing is saying, I'm proud to be ignorant and close-minded. And <laughs> yes, uh, like a previous interview, uh, this gentleman was telling me about the skeptic society representative coming to a situation had their own binder and the categories in the binder and that's yeah little uh prepared notes uh oh talking yeah. points uh, talking points to to refute things yeah. and uh, it doesn't doesn't seem like an object, objective way to look at things does it now in your experience through all these years how much have skeptics or whatever you want to call them debunkers affected your life well, you know, uh, skeptics, uh, you know, are responsible for a, a tremendous amount, a, a major portion of the of the uh, kind of negative uh, reaction that I've gotten everywhere, even in the media. They're, they're just drawing on skeptics for their material, and uh, the skeptics have used a lot of very deceptive kinds of statements and pretending to have science as their backing when they're not scientific at all. Going back to your situation last night when you and uh, Steve Pierce did your talk, you showed a clip from Geraldo Rivera with um, who was the actor that played Mike Rogers. He was in uh, Schwarzenegger's film. Robert Patrick. Yes. And um, you must have felt vindicated when he says, I totally believe him. Uh, Yeah. uh, You know, not just uh, Robert Patrick, but uh, um, James Garner said uh, that he uh, believes uh, believes it. And and a lot of very uh, prominent uh, uh, people have expressed uh, support. Yeah. Um, You know, I I never really say this much, but I I feel as though I have a pretty good BS meter. And, uh, you know, like I never felt any anything with you. And I mentioned to you the other day about my son listening to the podcast and being a skeptic, he totally uh, believes that your situation was true. And, you know, to me, that, that means a lot. Since you have this opportunity to talk about other things besides your incident, what would be a, something you'd want to talk about? Can you? Well, you know, uh, I did a, a workshop here recently um, in which I got into the whole, uh, you know, process of how to objectively analyze reports and how to separate the good cases from the bad cases and kind of, uh, you know, the rules of reason. And I really enjoyed that and uh, got a really good response from the people that attended. And have you put that to use? Well, I'm thinking of... uh, you know, expanding on that, I've, I really like that uh, that topic because you know, after 38 years of uh, being attacked and refuting attacks, I've learned a tremendous amount of uh, on that topic. I think I'm in a, in a in a position of authority to speak about that. Now, how many people contact you on a regular basis that want to talk to you because they feel as though they've experienced something that you have or? Well, I get I get emails every day, um, yeah. you know, from people who are reporting what they've experienced in their life, and and you know, it's it does seem that you know, um, you know, I can I can kind of ca- categorize those as we go along, but there's, you know, um, I think uh, legitimate reports every day, as well as some that probably aren't. Now, do you try to help these people? In, in, uh, uh, you know, sometimes they actually come to me asking for help, and it, it's kind of hard because, you know, there was nothing, no support groups or anything uh, back in the day when this happened, so I was on my own, and, and the methods I used to try to cope with it are not strategies that are recommended, um, you know, uh, denial. Com- yeah. compartmentalization and it, it worked for me in the long run but um, probably the best thing for them to do is to turn to these support groups. Yeah, I think they're springing up like this group that's here this weekend yeah. Starborn Support. Starborn Support Yeah, and yeah. that's going to be growing and you know just in the word itself support is in the title of it and, yeah. uh, and that's good because you know people do need a, a place 
to yeah. express mm, yeah. express it. Abductions was one of these things that I was on the total fence about, and it was really hard for me to to swallow that so many are happening. Do you believe that as many are happening as people well, claim? Well, uh, you know, because um, well, skeptics make the make the uh, error of trying to say, well, if I can prove that any are false, that means all are false. Yeah. But then on the other end are people who say, since some are uh, so definitely true, this validates everyone who makes such a claim, and I don't think that's true either. Yeah. Um, there are um, real ones, and there's some that I don't think are, because, you know, there's misidentified meteors, airplanes, and satellites, and... Um, extremely vivid dreams. There's all kinds of things that people take to be an experience that aren't, but at the same time, there's uh, a tremendous amount that are uh, legitimate re- reports and experiences. Now, could you go into a little more about this this training or this uh, conference you went to that categorizes? Well, I, I didn't get specific so much as how it relates to actual um, specific cases and I you know I've always refused to do that you know people say well pass judgment on this case tell me what you think of that case oh, and they I, do that to you? no yeah, I, mean, they I, ask I you, this? you know point to a bad one point to a good one see uh-huh. if I point to a good one then I'm ex- excluding ones and by implication saying they're not valid and uh, the rule is if I haven't investigated the case I'm not in a position to, to uh, comment on it um, but people ask you to comment often yeah I'm and sure. I've only made one exception in all this time. <laughs> Did it work? Uh, well, um, the Billy Meyer case. Oh, yes. I don't know anything about the case. I haven't researched the case. Yeah. So I wouldn't presume to pass judgment on it. Except Michael Horn, the American representative, yes. has made the flat-out pronouncement that Billy Meyer is the only one who's ever had any kind of contact or sighting, and anyone <laughs> who claims anything else is a fraud. So oh my uh, without uh, going any farther than Michael Horn, if what Michael Horn says is true, then Billy Meyer is not for real. But yeah. it may be that Michael Horn is overstating the case. I don't know. But uh, well, that's pretty much the consensus. it's only my own personal knowledge yeah. of the reality of the phenomenon elsewhere that I can say with absolute certainty that uh, – them claiming that no one has ever seen one but Millie Meyer cannot be true. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, talk out there that Billy Meyer is, you know, not so credible. Well, you know, so. I've heard uh, things on both sides on that case, yeah. uh, case, but just that one statement alone with my own personal experience gives me yeah. a certainty that... Uh, At least Horn is... Uh, if, yeah. if he's reporting accurately, if Billy Meyer really is claiming to be the only one... Yeah. Uh, then, uh, then it's not a valid case. Is there anything like if you had a chance to tell people out there that you've never said before? My main message with any of these cases is always that before you pass judgment on anything, get the facts first. And, you know, what you take to be, quote, the facts can't be limited to just uh, one side. You get as much information from as many diverse sources as possible, original sources if possible, before you uh, have an opinion. And if you can't get the information, withhold judgment. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Well, I think I can't think of a better way to end this uh, interview. Thank you so much, Travis. Thank you. It's always a pleasure seeing you. 